Welcome to Homestand Sports, the podcast for the passionate fan. I'm your host, Albert Vartanian, and I'm joined, as always, by my co-host, Justin Pooney, who... Still has goosebumps about CM Punk's massive return to the WWE. Well, on today's show, it's assessment time, Justin. After almost 20 games into their NHL season, are the Toronto Maple Leafs any better than they were last year? Well, the Oilers definitely aren't, but do we believe that their bad run of hockey is over after emphatic back-to-back wins this past weekend? And we end the show with Justin telling us why Alexander Ovechkin was right for what he said about the NHL. Lots to get to and lots to answer, so let's get this party started. I'm Albert Vartanian, and this is Homestand Sports, where stories, not stats, take center stage. Justin, we're about a quarter of the way through the NHL season, and I thought it was just a good time to assess where the Maple Leafs are currently at and match up what they're doing, I think, relative to what I thought their preseason mm-hmm. expectations were. I mean, the list is short, but the goals are big ones, right? Challenge for a division title, solidify yourself as a true Stanley Cup contender. 19 games in, I think we can almost cross off winning the Atlantic with the Bruins just running away with it after so, yeah. everyone thought they were going to fall off. But would you consider Toronto to be a true cup contender with what you've seen so far? I don't think I consider them a true cup contender to begin with from the start of the year, right? We looked, and again, when you look at this team and how it was, how this team was built, just that defense core and that goaltending to me are two glaring huge issues that are not going to go away anytime soon, right? It's clear, it's clear as day that they're not going to go away. Uh, unless a move is made or something is done by gradually to change it up, which we talked about ad nauseum last week. Um, to me, when I look at a true Stanley Cup contender, it's a team that can go into any building on any particular night and win, right? And we're going to see that kind of this week in a big week for the Toronto Maple Leafs. They play the Florida Panthers and the Boston Bruins, two teams who are they're looking up at in the Atlantic Division. They also are playing a Seattle Kraken team. That's been underachieving so far this year. I think we both can agree that the Kraken aren't what we thought they'd be after their last season's um, pre- postseason success. Mm. When I look at the Leafs right now, yes, they went to Sweden. Yes, they can came back on the road. And this weekend was not very good for them. The overtime loss to Chicago, and then they just didn't really put forth a very good effort in Pittsburgh against Kyle Dubas and the Penguins. Um, this is a team that I don't know whether it's they would feel like they can just flip the switch and play whenever they want to. And they know that they're talented enough as a regular season team to just get there. And their talent will carry them to another 100-point season, 50-plus wins like they've got the last two years. Um, but I, it's different now. But when you look at the Eastern Conference standings, there's a whole lot of parity. The last place team in the Columbus Blue Jackets are only seven points below the Toronto Maple Leafs. The Ottawa Senators are second last in the Eastern Conference, but they've only played 16 games, mm. right? They have a lot of games in hand. So what I'm trying to say is this Eastern Conference is nothing to take easy or take lightly. If I'm the Toronto Maple Leafs, every game is going to be a meaningful game. There are games, especially against Eastern Conference opponents, where it's going to matter when it comes down to the end of the season, right? That's why getting off to a hot start in the beginning of the year is so critical to me you're not playing catch up, right? You're not playing, you know, behind the eight ball. And there you have points banked for later on in case injuries show up or like as Leafs, no defensive issues or goaltending woes or whatever, right? So when I look at the Toronto Maple Leafs, are they a true Stanley Cup contender? Talent wise up front, yes. But in my mind, in my criteria, no. I don't believe they are true Stanley Cup contenders because the issues that they have are not going to help them win on a night in night out basis in certain areas and situations as the season progresses that are going to be very difficult at high pressure situations. Yeah. I look at them kind of the same. I think same as last year, they're still paying mm-hmm. four guys way too much money. They might have to pay the fourth guy even more. And then they have a decision to make because William, Neal- William Nylander is not making it easier for Brad tree living, whatever mm-hmm. the Leafs wanted to pay Willie that's gone. Now that number has yeah. gone up because of what he's done so far this season. But if you look back on last year, through the same amount of games, they're just a point off that pace. They've mm-hmm. actually they've scored more, but the biggest issue is they've allowed more. 15 more goals against than they did last season at this time. They've lost more games in regulation you know, than they've won this season. Uh, I think maybe played two complete games, Justin. I would say the one against Vancouver and maybe the one in Dallas as well. Uh, yeah. But it's a lot of the same issues, right? You have 
you have your top six who are carrying the scoring load more or less. I mean, the, the, the top line hasn't been great as of late, but I, honestly, I'm not worried about Marner and Matthews in the regular season. Those guys mm-hmm. will be fine. They'll go through some stretches, I think, where they struggle, but Keith will adjust the lines accordingly, and I think guys will bounce back. But you look at the bottom six, and overall, they've kind of been ineffective. Max Domi, who came in this year, is supposed to bring some snot and some offense. He's got no goals. Sure, he's got 11 assists, but no goals. I mean, Keith went 11-7 and seven the other night, and I think that tells you a lot about how he feels about that bottom six. Then the defense, again, is just it's not good enough, right? Giving up almost mm-hmm. four goals a game, which is like the bottom third in the NHL, chopping and changing the bottom. I mean, losing... Klingberg, a guy that Tree Living brought in, paying him four plus million now on LTIR. Looks like he may never play for the Toronto Maple Leafs again. We talked about that already, so I don't want to get into that too much, but that's a massive issue. And they still, after all these years, Justin, still don't have a number one goalie. I understand they're going with a tandem, but this tandem is below average. There's still no clear number one. Samsonov clearly has confidence issues. He lets in bad goals. Joseph Wall, um, I think he's decent. Can he be your number one right now from what I've seen? Probably not. So I can't I can't put them in the pool of true Stanley Cup contenders. I mean, I really thought they were going to push for an Atlantic Division title. I really thought that. But that was me thinking, okay, at least are going to bounce back. They might get stronger in the back end, which I think they will moving forward. And obviously the expectation for Boston was they're going to drop off after, you know, mm-hmm losing embarrassingly in the first round to the Panthers, losing some key guys. That didn't happen. They look like they're even better. Florida came into the season banged up. Doesn't matter. They're still playing really well. Tampa up against the cap. Guys who've played, I mean, too many games, right, with the Tampa Bay Lightning. They look fine, and they're still missing Vasilevsky. When he comes back, they're going to get even better. So, I mean, the Leafs aren't in a great position to win the division. I would knock that off completely. But the question about them being a true cup contender, I really can't put them in that category. I mean, just watch Boston, watch the Rangers, watch LA, watch Vegas, Mm -hmm. and the Leafs don't even compare to those teams. Look, when you look at the goals the Leafs are scoring, they're scoring 3.4 goals per game. They're allowing 3.4 goals per game. Too much. Exactly. You look at their offensive stats, again, as we expected, in the top half of the league, top 10 in most categories, right? In the defensive side, the bottom half, 22nd in goals allowed, 22nd in shots allowed, penalty kills 18th, uh, penalty minutes is 18th. So, that, you know, they're when I look at the Leafs, right, and I look at what they put forth, again, this is, again, the doing of the roster construction, but also, I don't know, there's no excuse that we mentioned with the Tampa Light, but these guys playing too many games and being fatigued. Mm-hmm. But on certain nights, I believe that, their best players have not shown. We've seen a lot of off games. We haven't seen, you mentioned the game against the Canucks, right? As some of their complete games. But even then, was that really a complete game hour? Because Marner and Matthews in that game were pretty much disappeared. We didn't notice them. I have yet to see a complete game of the Toronto Maple Leafs where from first line to fourth line, first pair to third pair and starting goalie, that everything clicked. I haven't seen that yet. Right, And when I look at teams like Tampa Bay, I look at teams like Boston, I look at teams like Florida, all the teams you mentioned, there's at least a certain sample size of games where we've seen their top gear. Now, that could be a good thing for the Toronto Maple Leafs that we haven't seen their top gear yet this season. But a quarter way into it, you would think that the Leafs um, you know, would play their best game now. Again, to equate it to the NFL, the Philadelphia Eagles have the best record in football and haven't played a complete game at all. I know it's different sports and stuff like that, but... When I look at the Leafs and I look at the, the issues that they have, it's not an issue that can just be mopped up or cleaned up. It's something that's going to have to require not major surgery, but you know, you're going to have to go in and operate on this team a little bit if you're Brad Tree Living. So you're going to have to move potentially a forward piece or a something like your prospect pool to improve that defense score. Right? We've talked about that. Are you going to be a buyer at the deadline for a depth goalie just in case, right? You mentioned, can you trust Samsonov in a seven-game series? Can, do you want to have further insurance for Joseph Wall in a playoff series, right? These are all questions that need to be answered. And when I look at Stanley Cup contenders, when there's there's a lot less questions, and so there's more answers than questions, right? And with the Leafs, I feel like we have a lot more questions than answers. And I that is the biggest reason why, again, they're not going to, be able to break that barrier of getting past the first two rounds and really getting into the final four and those really truly deep playoff runs is because there's just too many questions about this roster construction. Look, we've got Mitch Marner and William Nylander are now flipping positions apparently in the lineup. 
So well, that hasn't happened yet. It's been suggested. Officially, but there's been reports that it might yeah. happen through practice. But right. that to me, again, is questions are just every day there's a new question, new concern about the Toronto Maple Leafs. Right now, it's the defense and also Mitch Marner because he hasn't looked like Mitch Marner of late. Yeah, I mean, it's a lot of the same questions, right? The Marner thing is, is interesting. He's still getting his points, even though he's not playing well. But what do we know about Marner? He's a really good regular season player. Put him in the playoffs with no space, and he can't do the same type of damage. I will say this, to end this on a positive note, a semi-positive note. They're not in a terrible position in terms of how they've played relative to their record because they can clearly play better, and I think you alluded to that. But, yes, I mean, you compare them to some of the top teams in the league when you're looking at contenders. And I don't, I don't think they're close. I really don't. And bringing in, let's say, a Patrick Kane or something like that's not really going to help. I think moving forward, I want to see what Tree Living's going to do with this Klingberg cap space. If Klingberg is actually not going to play anymore, if he's done, which I think he is, he just hasn't really announced it yet. The Leafs haven't said anything. They're going to let this LTIR stint run out, and then whatever happens, happens. I'm going to assume they're going to use that money to get a defenseman, maybe make a trade, because if they don't do that, then it's just going to be another wasted season for the Toronto Maple Leafs, unfortunately. A team that is trying not to throw away a season had a pretty good weekend, Justin, in the Edmonton Oilers. So I'm going to ask, or you can ask me this one, actually, after the break. <laughs> uh, are the Edmonton Oilers back? Albert, 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 Albert. Another week, another Monday, where we talk about the Edmonton Oilers. The Oilers have had a positive weekend. They scored 13 goals. 5-0 yeah. win in Washington and a big, big, big 8-2 win against the Anaheim Ducks. So now we have to ask this question because it's the most pressing question, I think, in all of hockey. Mm. After these two wins, these two convincing wins, are the Edmonton Oilers all the way back? I don't think so. Listen, I need to see a solid stretch of hockey before I welcome them back to the party. You know what I mean? Let's not mm. forget. Okay, it, it was an impressive couple of victories. 5-zip against Washington, who... They've been pretty good, that Washington mm -hmm. team. I mm -hmm. think going into that game, they're 8-1-1 one, one, their last 10. So it was going to be a tough game for the Oilers. They came out with a shutout, which is huge for their confidence, not only for the scoring, but for the defense, for the mm -hmm. goaltending. I mean, the last thing you would expect from this Oilers team over the past few months, past few months, past month, is uh, like a few months. It, it, yeah, it feels like a few <laughs> months. Is good goaltending, and they got that in that game. Uh, against Anaheim, they won 8-2. The offense is looking good. But let's not forget, I mean, they had a really terrible start in that Anaheim game. I, I felt like they lost a ton of battles. They were outshot 7-2. They were down 2-1. Dreisaitl took a bad penalty. Stuart Skinner led in a bad goal. So at the start of the game, I'm like, here we go again. This is the mm -hmm. same Oilers. But listen, they persevered and they bounced back. And a lot of that comes down to Connor McDavid, who's really turned it around. I mean, this guy, I think, is in the top 20 in scoring right now. He might be the mm -hmm. favorite for the heart. How things change in just a couple of games. But the biggest plus for me is... Not just McDavid and Dreisaitl, obviously very huge that those guys are starting to get going, but a few guys are starting to turn it up right now. You got mm -hmm. Zach Hyman, you got Ryan Nugent Hopkins, Evander Kane, who's probably been the most consistent player throughout the entire season for the Oilers. These guys are all on point streaks, which is really good. It bodes well for the offense moving forward. And Connor said it after the game against Anaheim. He goes, we can't just light a switch and all of a sudden everyone gets going. And it's more than just two guys who can get it going. And it, I think that that's something we we should have focused on, at least myself. I feel like I was just narrowing in on dry saddle McDavid, but really only two guys can do so much in the NHL. They can just maybe start a spark, right? Start the fire. Mm -hmm. If the rest of the team isn't following, then it's not going to work. But it looks like that's happening. Hyman's looking pretty good. I think he's on a seven game point streak. You got dry saddle who still doesn't look great, but for a guy who doesn't look great, just, just tells you how good he is that he can just keep it going regardless. I'm yeah. pretty sure he leads the team in points. So they're trending yeah. in the right direction, but they got a pretty tough schedule coming up that's going to say a lot. I mean, they got yeah. they got the champs at home next. Then they got Winnipeg, one of the hottest teams in the league. They got to go to Winnipeg. And then Carolina, who just slapped them around 6-3 a couple of games ago. So I like the direction that they're trending in, but give me five or six games of really good hockey before I can bring them back into the party. Yeah, you kind of stole exactly what I was about to say is, Last time they won three straight, they lost three straight right away, right? They won two impressive games. This team has been so Jekyll and Hyde, in my opinion, that it's hard to, especially Jekyll and Hyde over the last couple of weeks, ever since they fired the coach, uh, mm. it's hard for me to say that they're back officially. But you mentioned it. McDavid went from like 57th in points to like tied for 13. Nine points in the last two games, 25 points on the season. 
when I look at this guy and I look at look at look at Dry Sidle, we've talked about it. They go as they go, the, the Oilers go. But I liked what I saw last night from <clears throat> Ryan Nugent Hopkins. He's been a guy who's been kind of invisible. This guy had 100 points last year, right? He's had he has had 13 points this season. Got off to a slow start. If Nuge can get going and start scoring and producing at a at the clip, not on a hundred point clip, but you know, hovering around a point per game clip, that will be huge for the Edmonton Oilers, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you still got the problems though in the back end. Evan Bouchard, you know, is still the defensive liability. Do we trust Stuart Skinner? I don't know. Um, I will say this though: only allowing two goals this past weekend for a team that's looked really bad defensively can do a lot confidence wise, and we know. Defense, it is about systems, but it's a lot about effort too, right? And I believe when these guys start seeing, hey, look, we can, you know, shut a team up. Again, Washington has been, you know, an impressive team, an impressive story. But I think the story is better than the team this year, right? Yeah, when you look yeah. at a team like Anaheim, who was, you know, very plucky this early on, but now they're kind of falling back to the pack as we expected them to. Um, beating up on teams that you should beat up on, Right. That's a confidence booster for this team. And I'm going to keep on saying it. When I look at this Edmonton Oilers roster and organization, there's so much pressure on them that even the smallest bits of confidence can get them going. We talked about it last week. That greasy goal McDavid scored, and he kind of said after the game, well, I remember how to score. It's kind of kick-started him, and he's starting to look like Connor McDavid again. Um, I just want to see... Like you mentioned, a sustained period of good hockey. Look, they're seven, two, and one. Sorry, seven, twelve, and one. Um, five and five in their last ten games. You mentioned the schedule. When I'm looking, I, lo- I took a peek at their schedule going forward in d- December. There's some winnable games. There's Chicago in there. There's a couple other easy games I think they can win, and a lot of them are at home. So it's time for the Oilers to make some headway. If at the end of December we're looking at the Edmonton Oilers and they are you know, 500 or, you know, slightly below 500. I think, okay, I can say, you know what? They've played a lot better in December. They're back, right? They're now in a prime position to compete for a playoff spot, heading into the trade deadline and all of that stuff. Um, This month is critical for the Edmonton Oilers. Again, we're going to say this again, how much they have to win. But this weekend could jumpstart them to having a successful December, but it's up to the team to continue playing well. Um, And it's simple as that. Look, we mentioned all the stats, all the drama, all of this. It's now time again for these players to continue this and not follow up a two-game winning streak with another two-game losing streak. I remember the most anticipated game of the season so far was when the Edmonton Oilers went to San Jose (laughs) and they lost that game, which was unbelievable. And everyone wrote them off. I wrote them off probably to a certain extent, which was Mm -hmm. way too early. But this next game against Vegas, to me, I'm so intrigued and I can't can't wait to watch it because you have the champs, one of the best teams in the league and the same teams that the same team that bounced you out. And now this is true. This is a true measuring stick to see where the Oilers are at. And I know it's a short amount of time. Like we're just over a month into the season and it's, it's felt like forever, but this is, this is a game where I feel like the Oilers need to win. And if they win it, I mean, watch out because that, that is a a true turnaround win. If you beat the Vegas golden Knights. Yeah. Look, they have, they play Vegas on Tuesday, Winnipeg on Thursday, and then they have six days off until they play Carolina at home. Right. So that six day break is massive, especially when you bring in a new coach, you don't get a whole lot of practice time right in the middle of a season. This is a six-day break for the Oilers where uh, Chris Knobloch can really come in and teach these guys on how he wants to run this team. It's almost like a, I would say, like a training camp within the season. And Mm -hmm. I think that break that they're going to have for that six days is going to be huge. They can really, really implement what this new system, how they want to run this team. And I think if they can get through these next two games, one and one or best case scenario, two and oh, and they get that practice time, and they get that ability to understand what this new coaching staff is looking for, watch out. I think they can really, really make some headway and really make some noise because they're going to have time to practice and time to understand the system, but also the confidence of having, you know, two solid wins or, you know, getting through a tough two-game stretch with, you know, some points in the bag. Yeah, they got to keep playing the way that they're playing. It's hard to believe Mm -hmm. that they're the best first-period team in the NHL considering how many blown leads they there have been. But listen, if they can play well and keep it tight, you never know what can happen. Mm-hmm. All right, let's wrap this one up. Coming up after the break, uh, there's been some breaking news, Justin, in the NFL. I want you to react to it. The Carolina Panthers have made a coaching change. We'll talk about that after the break. Okay, Justin, it's time for Take for Take. 
where we give you topics, me and you give our takes on how we feel about it. We've got some good ones today, starting we off do. with breaking news that dropped this morning, which is mm -hmm. Frank Reich, the head coach for the Carolina Panthers, has been fired in his first season with Carolina. The poor guy went one in 10, looked like he aged about a thousand years, but his time in yeah. Carolina is over. Yeah, man. It's look, you woke up to this. Um, I kind of figured that something would happen. If you were looking on, you know, Twitter and listening to the insiders last night, uh, David Tepper apparently went into the, the the locker room or was seen leaving his box and yelled out a massive expletive. Right, he wasn't happy. Um, and when you look at Frank Reich, I think he's a scapegoat for the fact that this team is just poorly built. There's Br Bryce Young, and then there's nothing else. There's Brian mm. Burns in defense line, but this team has no offensive line. No real weapons, no first round pick. They traded up for Bryce Young. And I think what makes it worse is what we're seeing in Houston with CJ Stroud. Mm -hmm. CJ Stroud looks like a top 10 quarterback in the NFL. He's already won rookie of the year. People are putting him in the MVP conversation. And look, they had a chance to win against Jacksonville yesterday in a massive divisional game. And CJ Stroud played lights out. Do I believe that Bryce Young can be a good NFL quarterback? Yes. Did I think Frank Reich could have been a good coach for Bryce Young? Yes, he's an offensive-minded coach. But this team was so poorly built, and I felt that Frank Reich deserved a little bit of a longer leash. Now, who are you going to bring in to coach Bryce Young? Because you're not going to give up on him because you can't. You don't have a first-round pick. Your first-round picks, so you're not going to draft a quarterback. You're not going to get Caleb Williams. So, to me, how do you go about this? You fire Frank, right? Are you going to go get a guy in college like you did with Matt Rule before, which didn't work out at all? You fired him anyway. So, when I look at this team and the Carolina Panthers, you have to build a team around Bryce Young. When you, you look at all the young quarterbacks we've seen, C.J. Stroud. They have a guy in Tank Dell, a rookie wide receiver who's played very well. They have good backs. They made a lot of smart moves. You saw what they did with Jalen Hurts in Philadelphia. Drafted Devontae Smith. Brought in A.J. Brown. Supplemented him with the, one of the best offensive lines in football. You look at young quarterbacks and how they take that next step. It's more so about the system you get put into when you're drafted. Why do you think Patrick Mahomes was so successful? Look mm -hmm. where he was drafted. Andy Reid had a guy in Tyreek Hill. Had a guy in Travis Kelsey. Now, if he got taken somewhere else, would he still be Patrick Mahomes? Maybe, but we don't know. Look at Justin Fields in Chicago. They got DJ Moore, but there's still issues on the Chicago Bears on the roster construction. So when I look at this team, again, Mac Jones is another example. As bad as he's been, who's he really throwing to, right? Not a whole lot. So when I look at the situation, Frank Wright was a scapegoat for a team that was poorly constructed and poorly built around their rookie quarterback. And I think seeing what C.J. Stroud is doing put a lot of pressure on owner David Tepper to fire Frank Wright. Yeah, how happy are the Bears right now, right? With, <laughs> with having Carolina's first-round pick, and they're probably going to finish last in the NFL. Unless they get this new, like, you know how it goes, this new coach bump or whatever. I don't think it's going to happen. We've watched a lot of Carolina, and clearly, clearly <laughs> – the worst team in the NFL. I feel for Frank Wright, but listen, he got paid off. He's probably going to just hang out for a little bit and he'll be fine. But the yeah, Carolina Panthers a, are a dumpster he'll, fire. He'll get an offensive coordinator job yeah, somewhere. Yeah, he'll be fine, right? But yeah. listen, the guy, he took a beating this year. Just he look did. at him, right? He, he looks he looked like McDavid did a couple weeks ago. Yeah, he did. Well, Albert, I think Frank Wright would be kind of a good fit as offensive coordinator in Buffalo. Oh. A team that, you know, fired their offensive coordinator, God. Ken Dorsey, who lost yesterday in overtime to the Philadelphia Eagles. Yeah. Um, Josh Allen has not, still not won a game in his career in overtime. The Bills are now 6-6 six and six on the season. So, Albert, their playoff hopes are dashed, and right? They're done. I, I can't. I can't say they're done, even though I think that they truly are, like deep down. But there's still a chance. You have Josh Allen, you got a pretty good chance. And they're not a bad team. They show that they can hang, right? They hung with the Philadelphia Eagles, where everyone's calling – you know, the next big thing, the champions, Jalen Hurts, he's him. He's going to win the MVP. The Buffalo Bills, for as bad as they have been, they hung around until until overtime. And I feel like they kind of threw away that game. One thing that the Bills are doing before I answer the question is they lose the hard way. Patriots, yeah. Mac Jones touchdown at the end of the game. Broncos, you remember that too many men on the field? Yes, yes. That penalty after Will Lutz missed a field goal and got a second chance and the Broncos won that game. And then obviously against the Eagles, um, I think that that throw to Gabe Davis, I think I don't know what Gabe Davis was doing, but that should have been a touchdown. That should have been a game winner for the Buffalo Bills. Didn't happen. But listen, in terms of the playoffs, it's not looking good. 
their stretch run, uh, they got Kansas City. They're going to Kansas City next. Then they play Dallas, the Chargers, New England, who they struggled against, and Miami. That's a difficult schedule coming up. And they also need the Browns, Texans, Colts, and Broncos to to fall out a little bit. I mean, I think the Browns mm-hmm. will. They got some serious injury issues right now, especially if Miles Garrett is going to be out with this shoulder injury. They're, they're going to drop. I think it's only bound to happen. Mm-hmm. But the Colts, Texans, and Broncos all have tiebreakers on the Bills. So not only do they have to go out and win, they got to hope for a lot to happen elsewhere for them to have a chance to even make the playoffs. Yeah, look, yesterday Josh Allen played as – like the best, ver- he was the best version of Josh Allen. Excuse me, Timothy. He was yeah, Timothy. He was looked like a combination of Bi- Cam Newton and John Elway. What I heard some people wow. talk about. Look, I look, I, look, he played great, and they still lost because why? Albert, he threw a pick. It yeah. was drops from wide receivers on that last play. Again, I don't know what Gabe Davis was doing, but also that's also on Josh Allen as well, right? right? Also, the Bills defense, Jalen Hurts. Went to his le- through to his left on that final drive to get the, the game time field goal, and they did not challenge him once again. This stems back from when the Bills lost to the Chiefs in the playoffs, where they collapsed in that 13 seconds. Right, the late game defense, which should be Sean McDermott, especially as a defensive guy, stinks. It sucks, right? And I believe this team cannot play situational football. And we know if you want to be a good team, we saw with the Eagles yesterday situational football and being good at that is what wins you games when they matter the most. Uh, so again, the bills are yeah. superstar, best player in the world, best play, baseball player who ever lived. Shohei mm-hmm. Otani. Apparently there's three teams that are chasing him. And that are of course, the Los Angeles Dodgers, the world series champion, Texas Rangers, and apparently Canada's team, the Toronto blue Jays. So yeah. Albert, yeah. let me ask you this. Mm. Otani, to the Jays to sell out all those season tickets and the team does absolutely nothing. Do you like that? He, obviously, I like that. You know, I want that to happen. And it's just report after report after report. And yeah. everyone online is trying to dismiss it. The Jays are pretenders. They're not actually in this thing. They're trying to drive up his price. I don't know what to believe, honestly. But this we're talking about this because this morning, Jeff Passan dropped an article. And there's literally two sentences in this article that have to do with the Blue Jays. And this is what it says. I just want to give out context. There are plenty of teams whose off seasons hinge on the right addition. The Dodgers, the Rangers, the Blue Jays are chasing the biggest star in the sport, free agent, two-way player, Shoya Atani. So I sent you that screenshot and I said, pop the you champagne. Did. He's coming here because Jeff yes, Paston is legit. It, it sounds like the Jays are probably interested. Are they actually going to make a move? I don't know. Do they have the money to make a move? Yes. And, Listen, if you can give the guy half a Billy and you bring him into the Toronto Blue Jays, that's a pretty fun team to look at. If you look at the top four in their batting order with Otani there, you probably got Springer, Bichette, if he stays. I mean, there's rumors about him moving, but Bichette, Otani, and Guerrero. That's a pretty good four in your batting lineup. And I know he's not pitching this year, but if you look towards next year, will he be back in the rotation after recovering from Tommy John? You got Gosman, who's still going to be there. Barrios, mm-hmm. Bassett, you know, Kikuchi, I think is a free agent in 2024, but pretty good rotation. And we don't know what's going to happen with Alec Manoa, but if he somehow bounces back, you got a pretty strong five, pretty strong rotation with Otani in there. And that's, I'm not saying anything crazy. This is not breaking news to say that Otani would make a team better, but they've been in the news a lot and they've been rumored to be going after Otani. So I'm just going to take it for what it is and assume that they actually are interested and it kind of makes sense in a way because the the Jays' ownership, they have the money, right? Out of all the teams in the league, they can match up with, with the Dodgers and the Yankees. They have that type of do-re-mi. Now, it comes down to Otani. Is it just about the money or is it about where you live and where you want to play? Because if you look at the Dodgers, the Rangers, the Giants, the Yankees, and the Jays, I would say all of those teams, all four of those teams except the Jays are probably closer to a World Series than them. Whoa. So if Otani is valuing a championship and money, he can go anywhere else. Look, I like the fact that Jays fans are getting so built up and getting so happy about this only to come well, it, crashing it has down. to be exciting, Justin. Yeah, of course, of course, of course. But you mentioned that the Rod- Rodgers has the do re mi for it. Have they ever been willing to make a big free agent splash like this? Like, can you, when you look at the history of the Toronto Blue Jays, right? Uh, You've been David a fan. Price, well, I would say probably. But David Price was a, a rental and then he... yeah. Left, right? I'm talking but, about yeah, you're agent. right. You're right. They really, they really haven't done that. Yeah. But why not, not gonna, now? But 
I just don't, it's not in their nature to do that, right? right? What What's going to make them flip the switch? Okay, we're going to give Shohei Otani half a billion dollars or maybe it's a four-year deal worth $250 million. I don't know, right? Yeah. Whatever it is, I just don't see the Toronto Blue Jays doing that. And you mentioned winning, right? The LA Dodgers, right? Say what you will about them. They've been prone to spending money. Hey, I think Shohei Otani of the San Francisco 40, 49 or San Francisco Giants, excuse me, would be a great fit, right? I think him with the Yankees would be an interesting fit. Um, when you talk about money and winning and stuff like that, money's going to play a factor, right? He's not going to take any discount just to win, right? This is his time to get generational wealth times five, right? Or times 100 or whatever, right? <laughs> if I'm Otani, right, I want to go where I can A, make the most amount of money, but mm. also be surrounded about around a team that's going to be competitive, right? Are they going to be a World Series contender right away? Maybe not, but are they going to be a playoff team? A guy who's going to make the playoffs? I think that could be something Otani does. I just don't see it in Toronto, man. I don't see it happening whatsoever. You don't see it because you don't want to see it, but it's going to happen, Justin Pooney. Okay, okay, let's end the show. I'm going to give you the final word, and this has to do with uh, Alex Ovechkin, who mm -hmm. uh, was interviewed in The Athletic, and he mentioned that he believes that when he and Crosby came into the NHL, they saved the NHL. What do you say to that? Alex Ovechkin, I am so glad in a culture in hockey where if guys stand up like that and kind of pump their chest out, it's, it's looked down upon, it's frowned upon, right? And Alex Ovechkin's always been a guy who's always spoke his mind. Uh, and done on stuff on the ice and em embraced himself and, you know, acted, was true to himself. In a league where guys don't really do that, Ovechkin was always that guy. And absolutely, they saved this league. Let's go back to what they came into. A league that just canceled the entire season. The Stanley Cup was not awarded, right? A lot of fans were turned off. They're pissed off because they lost the sport that they loved, right? The Pittsburgh Penguins were almost on the brink of leaving Pittsburgh because... They were horrible, right? In comes a guy, Sidney Crosby, the, the the number one overall pick the year for a whole year, right? I remember being a young kid and his junior games in the queue were on national TV, right? We remember that World Juniors in North Dakota where that was like the best hockey we saw that year. Those two guys came in. They were just hailed as the next Magic and Bird. It never got to that because they played in the same conference. They did have some epic playoff battles, but... Alex Ovechkin and Sidney Crosby were the two flag bearers, the guys leading the way out of the probably the darkest time from the NHL, right? That lockout season was bad. You know, games were on, you know, the outdoor network on in the States. You know, people weren't caring about it. There was the, it was, they're coming to the dead puck era. These guys opened up the league, were the two guys that took the league to where it is now. Now it's not where it needs to be, but look, they're on national TV on two of the biggest networks in the States. You can equate that to Sidney Crosby and Alex Ovechkin. The way they brought it to the mainstream. You know, Ovechkin was doing things with commercials with LeBron. It's, you know, Crosby and stuff like that. Like, these guys did things that took the league to the next level. They were the two most recognizable faces in a generation of hockey that people across the mainstream knew who Sidney Crosby and Alex Ovechkin were. Now they might not recognize them on the street, but when you ask people, the casual sports fan, Oh, you know, who are some of the best hockey players? Ovechkin Crosby. That is why these guys deserve more credit. When you look at the league and I saw, I heard somebody say, you never heard Gretzky or Lemieux or Bobby Orr said, we saved hockey. Well, the situation and circumstances were a lot different, right? Hockey was in a much different place. Uh, all those decades ago back in 05 06 this league was hurting badly they were in a dark hole and to have these two young guys not only live up to expectations but exceed expectations and carrying a whole league on their back he's absolutely right when alex ovechkin and Sidney crosby enjoy the time we have left of them crosby's playing great this year ovechkin's chasing the you know gretzky's record um I believe that there is no question in my mind the NHL is where it's at right now is because of Sidney Crosby and Alexander Ovechkin and the way they carried this league. And he's right. They saved the NHL.